Okay, I guess I'm live. This is our very first full reality check that we're going to do. Um, I'm Mark Tripp. If you enjoy what you're listening to and looking at, please click on that subscribe button and click on like. I really want to grow this channel. I make no bones about it. <coughs> uh, this is retirement money for me, so please help. And uh, hang on, I'm getting strange, bouncy things uh, from other programs here. Anyway, um, today in our discussion, we're going to accomplish two things, I hope. One is I'm going to give you an accurate history that uh, I'm sorry, but most people just don't do. And I'm going to show you how we think as objectivists and how you should, say, should think to avoid what I call the martial arts nonsense. And let me begin with this. The problem with the traditional martial art people is so many of them are believing a false narrative, things that never happened, and they don't challenge anything they're heard. Now, what makes this worse is they're divided into two groups. The students who are simply replying what they were told and what they spent money on. Now, one of the things I just got the other day, and I'm encouraging all of you, are these critical thinking cards. Now, it's basically, uh, supposedly, a regular deck of cards, but it has all sorts of information in here about things that are done falsely to defend an argument or a point or any of that stuff, uh, like anchoring, which means the first thing you judge influences your judgment of everything that follows. Anchoring is a no-no. And there's just all of that stuff. The best for what we're talking about now is the sunk cost fallacy. Means you irrationally cling to things that have already cost you something, whether it's time, whether it's money, but it's cost you something, so you're going to cling to it, even though it's not true. So let me begin with an area where lots of poo-poo comes in. We all know about, supposedly as pronounced jujitsu, correctly it's pronounced jujits, and if we're talking about old-style jujits, there's a U, not an I. Now, that whole thing is called Roma Kanji, which means where you take the Japanese language and you spell it out to be pronounced in the English language. And uh, you can look that up. Uh, I'm not going to deal with that here today. But uh, J-I-U, no, that's a mistake. It's not J-U-D, it's J-U-D-O, not J-I-U-D-O. So others have gone over that. But you'll hear lots of traditional martial artists talk about the effectiveness of battlefield jujitsu, that the samurai was a master of this unarmed combat system. And we may as well talk about this now. No military, whether it's samurai or Navy SEALs, is going to spend an inordinate amount of time with unarmed techniques. 
The idea in a battle is to kill the other guy and to do so efficiently and effectively and quickly. Unarmed techniques don't do that. I know you'll have lots of people telling you I'm wrong. Oh, we know all these deadly techniques. More on that later. Let us first decide and decipher to a samurai warrior what was jujitsu. And I'm incorrectly pronouncing it, so most of you will know what I'm talking about. What was it? If you believe there was ground fighting in a samurai, you're wrong. I know, I know. Well, they would fall down and they would roll on the battlefield. Uh, they don't spend a lot of time playing like that. And then you hear the big one. And this is probably one of the biggest BS comments made in traditional martial arts. They will say, Jiu-Jitsu was created so that if a samurai warrior lost his sword or broke his sword, he could take the sword <clears throat> away from another samurai warrior and continue in the fight. We're going to leave that statement there. That phone is going to ring. I knew it was. We're just going to let it go and let the machine get it. She was supposed to call 45 minutes ago, and we're just not going to pick the phone up right now. So I'm sorry it's distracting. This is live. I don't, I don't have the editing facility, so it just is what it is. Let's go back. When traditional martial artists or anybody really make a claim like that, we have something to do. And we're going to be doing this through all of our time together. And it's called science. Let me show you, if you're not familiar, with how real science works. Let's say, I say, if I eat one pound of asparagus and then I go pee, in my gas tank, I get 50 miles per hour. Now, yes, that's absolutely ridiculous and insane. But let's use it. In science, there's nothing stopping you from making that claim, even though it's ludicrous. The question becomes, has your paper been peer-reviewed? Let me explain. If I say, if I eat a pound of asparagus and I pee in my gas tank, I get 50 miles to the gallon, I'm expected to write a paper on it and to submit that paper to the scientific community that not only says my claim, pound of asparagus, pee in the gas tank, 50 miles per hour, but lays out every single thing I did to get that achievement. Now, what is peer review? Peer review is all of these other scientists and scientific bodies take the paper, follow the instructions, pee in their gas tank, and see what happens. Now, most of the time, when you hear something bizarre, like the claims the uh, product Airborne years ago had about stopping colds and all that stuff. The first question is, where's your paper? They didn't have one. So who peer reviewed it? Nobody. And in the scientific community, that claim is immediately dismissed. If I say pound of asparagus, pee in the gas tank, I get 50 miles to the gallon, but there's no paper. Yeah, you can say that, but it means nothing. So I put a paper together and I send it out. 
So now I can say, yeah, we submitted papers. And since we gave it to lots of people, it's been peer reviewed. But the question nobody asks, and it's important to ask, what was the results of the peer review? And all of the other scientists ate a pound of asparagus and peed in their gas tanks. And holy crap, they didn't get 50 miles to the gallon. Maybe their car didn't start at all. So the hypothesis was rejected. And that was the results of the peer review. Got it? Okay. Let us look at the claim that jujitsu to the samurai was if his sword broke or if he lost his sword. He could take the sword away, unarmed, from another samurai and get back into the fight. That's the claim. Okay, show me. You see, you can't say, well, yeah, this happened hundreds of years ago, but we can't make it happen today. That's not science. If you say an unarmed man can take a sword away from an armed man, science says, show me. And trust me, traditional martial artists get real upset when you say, show me. They've got all, I was driven off of Quora for that, guys. I was answering questions and ticking off all of the traditional martial artists because I would say they're full of crap. It's like that comment I gave you last week about the purple dragon in the garage. You can claim that all you want, but my next comment's going to be, show me. Show me your purple dragon in the garage. And then I'm going to get all the excuses why you can't. And then as a scientist, I'm going to say, that's an unproved assertion. They say again, let me put it plain, an armed man takes a sword away from an armed man. Well, here's all you have to do. I'm not suggesting you do it. It would be a painful education. Go to any kendo school. And that's where they wear the armor and they have the split bamboo swords called a shinai. And they beat the crap out of each other. All you have to do, find me your ultimate jujitsu guy that claims to be traditional, put him on the floor, and take the shinai away. I want to see it. Now, if you don't believe me, you're here on YouTube, go through YouTube, search for the words K-E-N-D-O, that would be the letters, Kendo, and uh, good luck. It's never going to happen. You're going to get the living crap beat out of you. So the assertion that an unarmed samurai could take the sword away from another armed samurai has zero proof. It is an unsubstantiated claim. And in science, we don't give a lot of bonus points to that. Now, I actually had years ago, I made that point. Somebody said, well, they don't fight with a sword today the same way they did back then. Okay, so they fought in such a way to make it easier to take the sword away. No, sorry guys, hate to break this to you. But when you make that claim, you're making an unsubstantiated claim. The idea that samurai were throwing people on the battlefield. Think about that a second. I'm going to drop my sword so I can grapple with you and throw you to the ground, face up, that's what they're saying, 
so I can deal with you. Well, first, I wouldn't drop my sword. Nobody would. And grappling in armor is a legitimate skill. But it's all leg stuff because you would never put your sword down to knock somebody down and stab them on the ground or use a very long tanto to do that. But unarmed, taking the sword away? Uh -uh. The one thing for sure we know about jujitsu for a samurai, it was the skill to get your arms free so you could draw your sword. That's what it was about. And if you need proof, have you ever studied a Japanese martial art? Have you ever noticed there's about a hundred techniques to deal with a wrist grab? And who in the hell is going to grab your wrist in a fight? That's ridiculous. But if we realize the samurai with the sword hasn't drawn it yet. If he does, you're about to be sushi. He's going to audition for Benihana on your body. You don't want that to happen. So when you reach for that sword, somebody's going to grab your arm or they're going to your wrist or they're going to pin your arms. And yeah, they practice all sorts of stuff to get their arm or their arms free to draw that sword and kill you. That claim is provable, and we can see it. All of the other stuff, they talk about striking methods. <clears throat> Please, you're all in armor. You're all wearing lamellar, and I'm going to punch through it. Again, show me the test. Show me the evidence that you can punch or kick your way through samurai armor. We're going to talk about this more when we talk about Okinawa. It's not true. Now, eventually, the samurai class ended in Japan. And what they called, which all these traditional martial arts talk about, this battlefield art. Well, the battlefield art was using a sword and a spear and bow and arrows and all that kind of stuff. The unarmed stuff was very little and very seldom. So when the samurai class went away and people were not wearing swords anymore, you had the next influx of jujitsu styles. And there was a bunch of them. And you had uh, Kitoru. I only mention that because Kanu Sensei studied it, or Kanu Shihan. Uh, Tenshin Shinyoru. Kanu Shihan studied that. But you had Daitoru and all sorts of other things. But you cannot call them battlefield arts. They were not used by samurai warriors in armor. Uh -uh. Now, in this period of Japanese history, these guys were rough and tumble. Some of the schools were actually ran by ex-samurai. Some were not. But they were rough and tumble. They were uh, thuggish in many ways. And God help you if you were a beginner. You got the snot beat out of you until you learned how to protect yourself and they taught you something else. Well, into this mess comes a guy named Jigoru Kano. And he studies Kitoru. And he studies Kenshin Shinyoru. Keep in mind, neither one of those are battlefield arts. The claim that Kanu created judo from battlefield jiu-jitsu systems is simply indefensible. 
There's no history of that. Sorry. Now, I could be saying things that your teacher didn't say. That's between you and your teacher. I have conflicted with people telling lies before. I didn't tell the lie, so it's not on me. If somebody came out and he's selling a bill of goods and I educate you, it's not on me. It's on him or her. Okay. And come noticed. This was pretty brutal stuff. And remember, Kanu was an educator. He had looked at this stuff with the eye of an educator. There wasn't any systematic learning. There wasn't any learning progression and on and on. And the big one, people were getting hurt. So Kanu decided, and listen carefully, Kanu was very, very big on Japan becoming a modern country. That's why Kanu was not a religionist. Kanu felt, I'm not saying right or wrong, I'm just telling you what he felt. Kanu felt that religion was a step backwards, not a step forward. And he felt his judo was a scientific approach to combat, different from all of those jujitsu systems. Now, one of the things you will hear all the time, because you have traditional martial artists who claim they belong to a legitimate Japanese jujitsu program, school, tradition, whatever, and they claim there's some headquarter group in Japan that they're responding to and answering to. And you're learning that because, here comes the quote, Kanu watered down jujitsu because he wanted to make a safe sport. You will hear that all the time. It's total bullcrap, but you'll hear it all the time. This is what Jigoru Kanu figured out. The way you train to defeat deadly and dangerous techniques that cannot be practiced is with safe techniques that can be mastered. In other words, training was to consist of a full power full speed, full resistance encounter with somebody who was trying to prevent you from doing it. That is legitimately what judo is all about. And it eventually begat Olympic and sport judo. But judo always had randori, and judo always had shiai, or tournaments. The people who say it didn't are not following history. And I am on several groups on Facebook, and I am here to tell you. Uh, mm -mm. They are wrong, wrong, wrong. If you're going to teach a technique that when you throw somebody, it breaks the arm, how many arms are you going to break? to master that technique. I'll wait. Can't be done. I see it all the time. But these so-called deadly systems, they're all either doing kata or they're doing one step. They are not doing full power, full speed, full resistance practice against an opponent trying to stop you. Now, why don't most people want to do that? Well, the name of this channel is Reality Check. And they don't want the reality check. They don't want to get on that mat and have to do it for real. And that is why, and I'm sorry to say this, but most of these traditional judo kind of groups 
are filled with people at the top who couldn't get on the mat to save their ass. Sorry. And when you confront them, they really get upset. But Kanu was not watering down anything. Kanu was eliminating things that could not be mastered and leaving behind things that could. And let's remember, to be honest, I put an arm bar on you. You tap out. I let go. That's sporting. So I guess you could call it a sport. But the truth is, I am being sporting with my opponent. I put the arm bar on. Student taps. I break his arm anyway. That's not sporting. But I could still do that because I've practiced it full speed, full power. So you get my point. If I'm in a street fight, I don't care whether the guy taps or not, he's going to lose an arm. I put a choke on. Again, if we're being sporting, he taps, I let go. You see the truth? It's not about sport judo. It's about our agreement before our competition to be sporting. And you will hear, and we will deal with it in coming weeks. Oh, MMA is not for a street fight. That's a sport. That has rules. There's a referee. There's no rules or referee in a street fight. Spoken exactly like a pompous ass that isn't going to want to do it for real against somebody who might hand him his ass. Yeah, he seems really tough in a controlled environment. But the great thing about MMA and the cage is step in there and show me. Are you telling me the only way you can win that fight is to poke somebody in the eye? We'll talk about that when we get to Bruce Lee. No, it's nonsense. It's total nonsense. But that is what Kanu gave us. And there's books. Jiu-Jitsu. The ultimate combat system. No, no. Japan's ultimate fighting art. Jiu-Jitsu before 1882. And what the book is saying is, prior to judo, jiu-jitsu was much more effective. Well, if that was true, it would have kicked the crap out of the judo guys, wouldn't it? Because in 1886, when they had the Tokyo Police Academy matches, it was judo versus everybody. And everybody pretty much got smashed. So, lesson number one. Traditional samurai jiu-jitsu was nothing more than getting our arms free so we could draw our sword. To a lesser extent, it was grappling and combat. But the main purpose was to get my arm free so I could get my sword. In the middle, before Kanu showed up, jiu-jitsu was all sorts of stuff. Some schools were predominantly striking schools. Some schools were predominantly grappling schools. But they were hell on the beginners. People got hurt all the time. And there was no systematic instruction. Kanu changed all that when we got judo. But even though that's a brilliant move, not so brilliant today. You have people today trying to lie to you about what Kanu did. They hate Olympic judo. You will see them all say, oh, Olympic judo is watering down judo. That's not judo as a martial art. And then when you talk to them and you ask to see Randori in their school, <laughs> good luck with that. Or you ask him to get on the mat and show me the difference. I argue with people all the time. Now, the, to be honest, when judo was first created, Kanu created the Kodokan, 
That's where everything was. Karate came to Japan because of Kanu, because he went and got Ichin Funakoshi and brought him to the Kodokan to teach striking, or what Kanu called advanced atame, to his black belts. And that opened the door for Okinawan karate to come into Japan. But, uh, and that's where everything was. And then you had a problem. Now, people will say, Kanu never wanted judo to be an Olympic sport. I just had that argument a day or so ago. What Kanu went to Egypt to meet with the IOC. Somebody just said, well, that doesn't prove he wanted judo to be in the Olympics. Everybody that makes that mistake. Okay. Then why did Jigoru Kano, in his elderly years and sickly, get on a boat, go to Egypt to meet with the International Olympic Committee? Why? What was the meeting about? If it wasn't to get judo into the Olympics, because Kanu, the modernist, and that's why we have judo in the first place, saw getting judo into the Olympics as a worldwide movement to give judo legitimacy. But the traditional people don't want to talk about sport judo because they can't do sport judo. You put them on a tatami against any sort of a local champion, not world champion, not national champion, not even a state champion, just somebody who's good in the local area. They're going to slam these people till the cows come home. But when judo, when the IOC said, yep, judo is an Olympic sport, all sorts of stuff changed because there's rules under the IOC how a sport has to be run. Number one rule, got to have a world governing body. And that was not the code con. It was the International Judo Federation. Because Japan itself wouldn't show an international governing body. And see, that's important because these traditional judo people still think the Kodokan controls everything. And that's how you know they're full of crap. They talk like that. We'll talk about that again when we talk about the Gracies. But it's not true. Once you've got a world governing body, then you get what they call continental unions. And these are groups that manage other groups. In other words, the United States and all of South America are in one continental body. Uh, Japan and Korea and others are in theirs. I think there's about five of them. And then you need a national governing body in each country for judo. And it never was the Kodokan. It was the All Japan Judo Federation. Now, yes, in the beginning, the All Japan Judo Federation, its offices were at the Kodokan. So there really wasn't a distinction. There wasn't a separation. But that had to happen. You will hear people to this day say, oh, no, I got my black belt at the Kodokan. No, you didn't. That's a lie. Especially if an American is saying it. Because an American is expected to get his rank through the national governing body of his country. Now, yes, the Kodakan now issues honorary rank. If you show them, for instance, with your national governing body card, that you have, say, a second degree black belt in judo. If you give them money, they'll give you a second degree black belt judo certificate from the Kodokan. <clears throat> but the rank isn't accepted anywhere. And it's expensive, which is why most people don't do it. We had a guy over here, and we'll talk about this down the road too, with a group called Juko Kai. I call them Juko Lai. And it's Grandmaster Rod Sarkanowski claimed to be 10th Don 
in half a dozen martial arts, which is just ludicrous. And he claimed an eighth degree black belt in judo that he got in Holland. Except, as I explained to you, Holland wouldn't be giving an American rank in judo. It violates the International Judo Federation's rules. The truth is, when Olympic judo came in, all sorts of programs in the United States shifted to just teach this new rule Olympic judo. They stopped teaching self-defense. They stopped teaching other things. And yeah, lots of students floated away. They didn't want to go to tournaments, didn't want to be an Olympic champion. And we left them alone. Now, some places didn't. Lots of judo schools still taught self-defense. And several years ago, the International uh, Judo Federation, IJF, issued a directive that said every judo school is supposed to be teaching competent, effective methods of self-defense. Now, almost done for today, but I want to deal with something because I want to show you how awful this can be. When you go on these websites or these groups, and it's full of these traditionalists, they will say things that if you really understand judo, you realize they're full crap. Um, they'll talk about strength is necessary to do judo. It should be technique, not muscle. You have to know the kata. Well, for my closing remarks today, I'm going to show you a book. Now, this is the reprint. But this says Judo Training Methods. It's by Ishikawa and Don Drager. This book came out in the 60s. And it was the most revolutionary judo book ever. Now, I hate to do this, but I got it. I'm really sorry. I'm old. You guys just figured out <laughs> these aren't real books. They're over there. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm old. Sometimes you just got to go. That book, Judo Training Methods, was considered sacrilege. It was the satanic Bible. Everything in it was going to ruin your judo, was going to destroy it. Don't follow what they say in there. They were that serious. Okay. If you're watching me today in 2021, what do you think they said in that book that was so revolutionary? that was met with such resistance. And yet, today, we do it all the time. We would think you were insane if you didn't do it. And every champion in judo on through, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, mixed martial arts, whatever, every single person is doing it. But the traditional people back then went nuts. What does this book teach and support? Are you ready? Weightlifting. This book says you need to lift weights to have stronger judo. And the judo world that believed the bullcrap 
that strength doesn't matter, said if you build your muscles up, you will rely on strength, not technique, and it will ruin your judo. And yet, every Olympian, every champion, every contender, all lifts weights. That's what this book is about. Now, it is out of print. You cannot get it anymore. And I'm sorry about that. But there's great stuff in here. And uh, it's old. This shows in the United States that it was the AAU here that was the collecting of everything. And they went to the Kodakon. But uh, that ended. So what am I saying? Well, when somebody makes a claim that sounds outrageous, apply science to it. If you're saying an unarmed man can take a sword away, pick your unarmed man. Let's go to a kendo school. Show me how it's done. That's how science works. If you're saying weightlifting is going to ruin your judo, how come all the weightlifters are kicking your ass? Now, to get ready for next week, I need you to Google jujitsu advertisement. And when you do that, you're going to find some very old ads that look a whole lot like those Charles Atlas ads. But when we get together next, we're going to talk about judo's rise in the United States, why it fell, and what replaced it. And eventually, we're going to get into the incredible claims made by karate. And we get into a new thing, which is what we call the Superman. Every martial art fad. In judo, it was the small, wiry, Japanese man. Again, it's always about little guys beating big guys. But when we get to karate, we get the new piece, which is there is always a Superman that we worship who is violating every law of physics they can to make them Superman. And we're going to go from Masatatsu Oyama we're going to go to Bruce Lee. We'll eventually end up with Hicks and Gracie. And I'm going to show you where all of these claims simply are not true. Have a great week, guys. Please remember, subscribe, hit like. If you got a question, let me know. I'll try to answer it. And I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.